Hi, my name is Chelsea McQuaid, and I'd like to tell you today about my good friend, the Chronosaurus, probably one of my favorite specimens in the museum. It's been my favorite ever since I first went to the museum when I was five years old. My qualifications for favorite specimen at the time was he looks like a dragon. But there's a lot more to him than just being a really cool sea monster. The Chronosaurus is not a dinosaur, but an animal called a pleosaur. A pleosaur is a short necked sea reptile more closely related to today's lizards, not dinosaurs. The pleosaur would have been an active predator using all four flippers to push itself through the water. This was the jaws of its day in the waters of Australia. Teeth markings have been found matching Chronosaurus teeth in various sea animals of the time, from other large reptiles to mollusks. The story of our specific Chronosaur begins in 1931. There was an expedition from Harvard's Museum of Comparative Zoology to complete the collection of Australian specimens. While the primary focus of the expedition was on living creatures, they had a fossil enthusiast in their midst. He had been following up on a tip from a rancher about something odd poking out of the rocks. Our scientists saw these bones and realized they matched the first chronosaur fossil found, a jaw that had been discovered years earlier. Within a few weeks, the expedition had removed the rock containing the monster and shipped it to the United States. Preparing these fossils, though, costs a lot of money. So the chronosaur languished for 20 years in storage until local businessman, Godfrey Lowell Cabot, a man after my own heart, found out about it. He was fascinated by sea monsters and spoke to the museum director of the time about them. The director mentioned that they had one, the chronosaur, all stashed away in a closet. When Cabot asked why it wasn't prepared, it was admitted there just was no budget. Within a week, Cabot personally funded the Chronosaur's freedom. Finally, as of 1959, our friend is now enshrined as one of only two Chronosaurs on display in the world and the largest found. He is almost complete and watches over thousands of visitors who come to admire him over the years. Truly a happy ending for him. But not everything is quite copacetic. See, this Chronosaurus has caused controversy. Now, when you look at him, he looks fine, but look, the color is perfectly uniform, as are all the textures on the bones. This isn't very common in fossils. Remember, this skeleton was mostly complete, so what's real and what's fake? You can't really tell. The skeleton was completely plastered over and then painted. Now, we know from some notes approximately what is real and what is not, and that during the restoration, some extra bones were added. Due to discoveries of other partial chronosaurs in Australia and Colombia, ours doesn't quite measure up. He measures too much. He's too big. Almost a full eight feet too big. But this is not the first time something like this has happened in paleontology, especially if it's a creature as rare as our chronosaur. Paleontology is full of educated guesses as we compare extinct animals to those living today to make assumptions about their lives. We have to adjust our understanding of extinct animals as we find more evidence. So as we find more chronosaur fossils, we will know more about its life. The world of the chronosaur is alien to us. A tooth can tell us diet, hips can show us how they move, entries can tell us how this animal potentially lived and maybe died. But we still won't know. Did these creatures vocalize? How did they attract their mates? How were their babies born? And did they take good care of them? We can only guess since we're never going to get to visit their strange and beautiful home. And even if we did, we would be aliens on our own planet.